saints who died and yet are alive with you, especially John Wesley and Charles Wesley, whom we commemorate today. Receive us with them into your eternal embrace. Merciful God, Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made, but and you forgive the sin of all who are penitent. Create in us a new and honest heart, so that truly repenting of our sins we may obtain from you, the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. See, now is the 
the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our work, with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance and affliction, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet are well known, as dying, and see, we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Word of God, word of life. The good news of Jesus comes to us in the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in synagogues and street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they receive their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. As we come together on this holy evening, we hear words that have been shared by Christians on Ash Wednesdays for centuries, for generations. I thought about these words from the prophet Joel, which have been spoken throughout the decades, throughout the generations. A great and powerful army comes. Blow the trumpet, sanctify a fast, call an assembly, gather the people, assemble the age, gather the children, even infants at the breast. A great and powerful army comes. Spare your people, O Lord. How powerful for the images we have been seeing on the news in the past few days. Infants, aged, everyone uh, of imaginable places in life uh, being, uh, being evacuated from their homes, from their nations, on streets and camps. Those words that have been read throughout the ages for a people almost 2,700 years ago facing such a circumstance now echo in our hearts here those 2,700 years later. In the, Old Te in the New Testament lesson, Paul speaks of these words, afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, addressing people of faith 
700 years after the words of Joel were written, roughly 700 perhaps. And in the midst of all this, this echo of the ages, we come tonight and we come forward and ashes are placed on our foreheads and we hear these words, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. It's a very somber, ominous sounding phrase from scripture. Remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. And yet it tells us something powerful about our God who has journeyed with humanity throughout all these centuries, throughout all these generations, this humanity that continues to inflict pain and suffering upon fellow members of God's one human family. Sleepless nights, imprisonments, beatings, calamities that have continued throughout the ages. When we hear those words, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. And they say something about our frailty and our imperfections and our brokenness as human creatures. But they also say something beautiful and powerful about God. Uh, they have their roots in that poetic account of creation in Genesis 2 where it says, God took dust from the earth and formed the first human beings and into them breathed life. And into them breathed life. Now we know when you're writing a poetic account of creation over uh, thousands of years ago when people are just barely surviving in nomadic spaces and gathering around tents and campfires, it doesn't do any good to talk about organic chemistry and carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen molecules being formed together into a neuroelectrical system and DNA and RNA and all those things. And so it explains yet in that old poetic ancient way how God took, take, took all those elements, the elements of the universe found in our planet that God created and put them together in some mysterious way over whatever time it took to eventually end up with human beings and to God for his special life. And we hear those words tonight, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return as a reminder of what amazing things God can do. That God can take things like organic molecular molecules which people long ago had never even heard of and put them together to form life. And to breathe into life human beings who Genesis 1 says were made in the image of God. Not because God looks like this, thank God, in a physical way, but because God creates us in the image of God, that imago Dei, meaning we are human living creatures who have the ability to love and be loved, to think and plan and vision and ponder, to forgive, to be in relationships, to be something that reflects God's own to have freedom and to make choices and to make decisions. Because we're frail human beings formed from dust, our decisions aren't always perfect, whether it be as nations, whether it be as empires, whether it be as, uh, as humanity throughout the ages, or whether it be just in our own lives. And so we gather here tonight as each and every one of us is a witness that God can take something ordinary as compounds of the universe, chemical, organic things, and form them into something beautiful and powerful. Sometimes, sadly, we use that power to inflict suffering on others. But at the same time, God gives us that power so that we might bring hope to others and reflect the image of God's love and God's hope for the world. And so when you come forward and are marked with ashes, it's not just a blob of ashes thrown on your forehead, but it's a blob of ashes formed very carefully in the shape of a cross, which in and of itself speaks of the power of God, the power of God to work through the worst suffering human beings can inflict on each other, even torture and an execution instrument like a cross and turn it into a source of hope for all of humanity and all of creation. 
And if God can take something as awful as a cross and turn it into a symbol of hope that we cherish and wear around our necks and put on pastor's stoles and put in our worship places, take that awful instrument of torture and turn it into a symbol of hope. So too, God can take these ordinary piles of dust into which God has breathed life and transform us in spite of all our mistakes and our brokenness and our pain and our suffering and all the ways we have gone astray and lead us to human beings, to be human beings who can be changed and repent and by the power of the Holy Spirit have the direction of our lives changed so that instead of being instruments of torture and pain for one another in the human race, we can still be instruments of hope because we are marked with the cross of Christ and we have the power of God and we have the power to cherish things like patience and kindness and holiness of spirit and genuine love and truth of speech and even these piles of dust can convey the power of theme for Lent is being stretched by the cross. The H, the O, the P, and the E extending from the center of the cross out into the world. And it's our call this Lent to receive the cross of Christ, to acknowledge the miracle that rather than just being ordinary dust, we are dust who have been formed in the image of God and who carry the power of God to be hope for the world. And so we don't walk through life clinging and holding on to everything for ourselves. But we walk through life as Jesus did with our hearts and arms stretched as wide as they will go to share hope. To share hope. Not clinging to it for ourselves and for our own sake. Not opening up just a little bit to share it with people who look like us or think like us or speak like us or worship like us or people we like or people we care about or people who are part of our family or our whatever. But arms stretched wide to extend God's hope to all the world. Just as Jesus stretched those arms wide on the cross. So powerful the image on the little crosses we carry this earth that have the arms of Jesus and his love stretched. gospel lesson speaks of treasure and how we can fill our hearts with so much treasure that in the end means absolutely nothing. My prayer for you this Lent is that you will treasure something which the world thinks is absolutely meaningless. Just a pile of ashes placed on your forehead in the shape of a cross and that you will carry that image in your heart that that will be your treasure. Knowing that you have been formed by God from dust of creation to bear God's image to the world and have arms stretched wide to share hope. To share hope. Because this world needs hope. And God is
death to life. And our children and our life in Christ is renewed. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for God's mercy. We are created to experience joy in communion with God, to love one another, and to live in harmony with creation. But our sinful rebellion separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, so that we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to the discipline of Lent, self-examination and repentance, prayer and fasting, sacrificial giving and works of love, strengthened by the gifts of word and sacrament. Let us continue our journey through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection.
dust of the earth. May these ashes be a sign of our mortality and penitence, reminding us that only by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ are we given eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ has prepared the feast. Come to the table where all are welcome home. Amen. Thanks be to God.
keep you in his grace. Amen. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation. Yes.